big networks. And uh, we run a distribution business. We are headquartered in Mumbai. We sell to every channel of the food business, which is retail and food service. When we say every channel, we mean uh, the multitude of channels within food service and retail. Uh, practically the whole nine yards is what we cover. Uh, we were established in this business uh, in 1994, and we do frozen, dry, chilled, all kinds of products. Uh, uh, what we have done, uh, uh, I mean, our claim to fame is that we've launched more new food concepts in this business in the two and a half plus decades that we've been around than any other distribution company was its all. So uh, we really take pride in that. Uh, we've launched, uh, in fact, vegan mayonnaise and uh, also vegan cream back in the 90s. That was a time when plant-based uh, proteins or this entire concept was hardly spoken about. And, uh, but yeah, we were very enthusiastic to do this and uh, uh, we continue on that journey. And so today I want to share with you my thoughts on what should be the uh, channel strategy uh, for selling smart proteins in India. And what has been our experience? So in the last few years, we participated with a whole host of brands in this category, uh, right from uh, mock meats to, uh, to uh, dairy alternatives, to uh, snack food companies, supplement companies, all in the space of plant protein. And my introduction uh, in this was uh, done at home. Uh, 20 years back when, uh, you know, my son was born, we were introduced to Vijaya Venkat and uh, she was, she was uh, an evangelist for the vegan lifestyle, for the plant-based protein lifestyle. So now I'm, without wasting more time, I'll just get straight into the seminar now. So as you all know, I classified the entire business into these four categories. And I think in terms of uh, market share, that is how it flows. The dairy alternatives market is the biggest market. Uh, the next one is the meat alternatives. Then there's the snack foods. And then there's the supplements. When I say supplements, I mean basically uh, like, uh, uh, you know, nutraceuticals or uh, wait. Uh, nutraceuticals and uh, the category of uh, protein shakes, as an example. So, who is driving the consumption, right? So, it is the health seekers, it is people who are conscious of sustainability, particularly the millennials, the Gen Z, uh, people who have empathy to animals. Uh, the school and trending today, you, uh, Virat Joshi, I mean, uh, Virat Kohli, uh, Anushka Sharma, Amir Khan, and so many more. I'm sure uh, you've heard of enough people uh, taking on to this as a lifestyle, and it is very cool. Uh, your boasting rights every time I go to a party these days, there is definitely something vegan on the menu. And the main consumers are flexitarians and dairy consumers. So when we, when we look at flexitarians, I would also like to draw your attention to this, to the fact that, you know, uh, when it comes to the mock meats business, uh, you know, the, the vegetarians is a big bottleneck. You just can't get them on to, uh, to, to try mock meats uh, or you can't sustain their interest in mock meats. Uh, so later on in the uh, going further, I'm going to speak a little about this, uh, but I just want you to keep this in mind. So now the biggest challenges of this category and spreading this category is how do you create availability? So retail stores, e-commerce, direct to consumer, e-commerce marketplaces, I mean, uh, 
general trade stores, you know, the gourmet stores around the corner, uh, like the Cheda stores, the society stores, uh, or the specialist stores which, which store, you know, health food products, vegan products. Uh, they're all there, uh, but getting into them is a whole different ballgame. It needs, uh, it needs listing fees when it comes to modern trade. Uh, it needs a sales team, which means a real field force. If you want to uh, approach the entire market of such stores, and they are far and spread across the entire city. Uh, so that is definitely a big challenge for a lot of brands. The second is education and awareness, right? I mean, people know of the products, but have they really tried it? Do they know how the experience of that product before they invest their money into it. Uh, so that is a big challenge. Uh, so encouraging consumption comes through sampling and tasting, but mind you that sampling and tasting uh, exercises or promoters exercises in stores is a very, very expensive uh, concept, right? I mean, the returns uh, against this investment are pathetic. That's what we've seen because what they end up selling is a small fraction of what the cost of doing that entire exercise is. Uh, and then comes the question of, uh, you know, repeat purchase and scaling it up, because this is very, very essential. When you talk about uh, scale, you need a base of loyal clients who keep coming back again and again for your products. So a client acquisition cost, or as they call it CAT, uh, versus LTV is a big challenge over here that I'm talking about. And hence we come to the question of the economic viability of doing this entire uh, thing uh, of you know, educating the customers, uh, bringing awareness about your brand uh, and about the experience of your brand. Uh, this is, uh, this is a big challenge to be addressed. And so I have been a big proponent of, uh, you know, treating food service channel. And as I'm sure most of you know it, but however, for the sake of clarity, when I say food service, I mean, hotels, restaurants, caterers, bakeries, um, you know, where they make food and they serve food. So this channel is the best solution for addressing the above challenges. It is the most economical way of introducing your products. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to uh, talk about Starbucks here, you know, as an example. So I knew this for a fact uh, that about four years back or three years back, just the year when COVID hit, uh, Starbucks alone was consuming close to 30,000 liters of oat milk alone. And mind you, Starbucks has the best TG when it comes to uh, what I said, the millennials and Gen Z, which are the biggest adopters of a plant-based lifestyle. Uh, so, um, you know, they have had, I would say that they have been like a big contributor to the increasing pool of consumers in that entire category, right? And especially when you look at Starbucks uh, uh, menu, you know, more than 50% of the sales comes from frappes, which are really exotic, but which is like uh, a mix and a blend of so many flavors that the original coffee flavor is quite uh, 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 is, is not just the only thing which drives their business. Uh, and hence, you know, the consumer is open to, to experiencing new flavors and new tastes. And then they find that, you know, oat milk or almond milk was really not very off, uh, you know, their acceptance of those products. And then, then going back home and buying those products is going to be so much more easier. Uh, I'm also going to sh share with you today a graph uh, of uh, you know what has been our experience in real numbers, right? Uh, 
So what we've observed is that some of the food service outlets, they started as small as buying 2,000 rupees worth of products every month from us. And just over a period of 18 months, I just took a snapshot of what's happened in the last 18 months. And most of those customers who were the consistent buyers of these products moved from uh, 2,000 rupees to close to 20,000 rupees just in a matter of 18 months. So as you can see, you know, where the, uh, uh, you know, where the food service outlet has been consistent and, uh, uh, you know, has like a strategy, uh, which is usually uh, co-authored, if I may say that, uh, with the uh, manufacturers or brand owners of plant protein, uh, uh, they've really succeeded in expanding their uh, consumer base for such products, not only benefiting the brands, but also benefiting them. And in turn, they get boasting rights of saying, hey, you know what, we've got like this really interesting menu of plant-based products and people just can't, uh, you know, have enough of this. So, you know, what, what drove this? What drove this? Uh, change, in my opinion, uh, was that, you know, there was an engagement uh, with the chefs, with the FMB guys, with the culinary guys behind uh, their, uh, uh, you know, very interesting menus were created of gourmet products, fun products, uh, right from appetizers to uh, desserts to main courses uh, to beverages uh, and uh, you know careful attention was paid to the fact that you know the consumer experience in terms of taste has to be at par with what uh, uh, otherwise you know milk based products or meat based products would give so the art was created by the chef. It was like a joint endeavor. And then this was promoted by putting those options on their menus, you know, creating challenges, you know, like uh, uh, competitions, IPL events, uh, so on and so forth, around the plant-based uh, product offering that they had. Uh, it was very interesting. And it definitely gave great results, very, very encouraging results. Here, you know, I would like to stop and actually show you some numbers. Let me just, all right. This is, what we've done is we've created a bar graph of uh, what has happened uh, across the multiple channels, uh, sorry, multiple brands that we do business with in the food service business. And uh, so we've taken an average uh, between all the brands and that's how this is plotted. So as you can see, you know, we started in April of last year at 2000 uh, rupees per outlet. That was our sales. And it peaked in the month of April at 18,000, a little above 18,000. And now it's sustained close to uh, 12,000 rupees. And mind you, uh, this graph, uh, this line, which is the uh, number of customers that we have for uh, on an average per brand is, uh, does not really represent uh, clearly what has happened here. So, what we've noticed is that, you know, there's more than a 50% churn of customers, which means people are very enthusiastic to accept these products uh, as new offerings in their menu, but they don't sustain it. So more than 50% of the customers on an average get dropped off, uh, you know, after two months that we get them started. So we barely managed to get one more repeat and that's it. The enthusiasm dies. So, Again, what is important is the engagement, right? I mean, uh, at what level of engagement have you managed to 
Just one moment. Yeah. At what level of engagement uh, have we uh, interacted with the team, uh, with the people behind uh, creating new, I mean, chefs and uh, founders of restaurant chains or restaurants, uh, the f &B director, and uh, uh, clearly the game is to go deep rather than to go wide. Another interesting thing which I noticed in this space was you know, localizing the products. I think Shakahari is a great concept, right? Uh, or is a great, great example uh, to explain that concept. So they came up with a samosa, which was really uh, tasty. Okay, it was just a samosa. And if you eat it without keeping in mind it is plant-based or smart protein-based, it's just a tasty product. And they have uh, by far outsold all the competition. They came in late, but they overtaken their competition uh, very soon. And the strength comes from the product itself. So uh, please pay attention to this of localizing the products, bringing it to the palate. And this is what I was speaking about earlier that you know the magic is in the hands of the chef. Uh, another interesting twist which I see is I think I would like to draw attention on the soya chaap journey, right? I mean, uh, soya chaap came into this country and became popularized more than two decades back. But it has had a consistent and very, very interesting growth rate. Uh, soya chaap today is considered nearly like a vegetable, like mushrooms, right? So soya chaap has become a category of its own. And the only reason why it got adapted at that point of time was not as a meat alternative, but um, you know, just a cheaper product to have as a meat alternative. The, 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 the key word there being cheap, right? Uh, or uh, cost effective. And now uh, a very interesting product that we are working on, which is called the Procha. Now the Procha is nothing but, you know, a more, a more evolved version, if I may, if I may loosely use that term, a more evolved version of a soya chap or uh, or uh, uh, a challenger to mock meats. And mind you, this is created by Good Dog. They were the first, they were the pioneers in this space. And uh, now we found so many multiple uses for this product. And the first use case is because this comes at a price point, uh, which is very, very competitive. Uh, it is at a lower price point than any other mock meat that I know of. And people are adopting this product uh, even to blend uh, in their uh, uh, regular kima, for example, right? Uh, because it adds uh, adds to the mass of the product, it adds a different kind of texture, a mouthfeel, and overall, uh, you know, the chefs love it. And of course, it, uh, needless to say, but it helps them to bring the cost down. You know, today, if you look at goat meat or mutton, uh, the cost is upwards of 500 rupees a kilo. And whereas this product is much, much, much cheaper. So this is what people should be looking at, you know, when they look at food service. And I would say that the channels in terms of uh, the priority of launch of your brand should be in this order. You should first go for the low hanging fruit, start your online website, uh, reach out to your consumers, whether online or offline, whichever way. Uh, the e-commerce marketplaces, there is enough of a latent demand of these products. And that's why e-commerce marketplaces have been the largest sellers of this product for many, many, many brands. And of course, you know, the lifestyle and health food outlets, when I say these, uh, generally these are all entrepreneur driven. So the connect of the founder with his consumers or his customers is one-on-one. -on -one. And these guys are great sales guys. 
Okay, give them enough money in their pocket or enough margin and enough throughput per square per square feet, uh, and they will sell for you. Uh, and mind you, I'm using the word throughput per per square feet per cubic cubic foot. Uh, because this is the real metrics which they measure. It's not just about the margins which they get in the business, but it's how much money or how much margin they grow per day per square feet that they allocate to a particular brand. So these are great guys. Uh, you know, the average product of this, uh, average price of this product is pretty high. Uh, and uh, uh, with say an average margin of between 25 and 30%, which is generally offered to these guys um, for from uh, you know startup brands or new uh, new categories of products is usually on the higher side. And that's why I say 25 to 30. So they have a handsome margin per unit of product sold. But again, the same thing, you know, go deep rather than wide. So build these outlets, and this is exactly, you know, I don't have a chart right now uh, on what has happened on the retail space, but very, very, very similar uh, behavior um, as I showed you in the food service uh, graph there, that, you know, out of, in fact, over here, we've got uh, a retention of less than 30%. So the customer churn is close to 70% uh, every quarter which means we, we bring new customers to the table and we lose more than 70% of those. But the 30% who remained with us have really, really grown. The fourth would be the food service outlets. And uh, I can't stress enough, in fact, I've, uh, that is the main agenda here, is that these guys are, food service outlets are the best guys that you want uh, in your belt. Um, because these guys are the ones who are actually going to help you evolve your product. Uh, you know, your product market fit will be better, sustain buying, um, and, and uh, the effort of uh, repeat um, order booking is negligible. You know, once they have a product on their menu and they've got customers who like that product, you don't need to bother about these guys and keep coming back for more and more, and you can scale this business immensely. So at a life cycle, at this life cycle of a company, you know, in the first initial few years, uh, this is a great channel for you to milk. And I put modern trade as last, not that their consumption is low. In fact, Nature's Basket is the biggest buyer that we have currently amongst all the retailers or amongst the biggest buyers. Uh, but modern trade, what happens is that uh, you know, you need the cost of doing business with modern trade is very high. Firstly, that is a distinct key. Second is you need a merchandiser to go to these outlets and, uh, you know, keep uh, making sure that the cabinets or the shelves are full and your products are displayed well. Uh, returns are usually very high. Uh, what is lacking here is also to a degree, you know, the entrepreneur is missing. Uh, and hence, I rank modern trade, uh, uh, you know, lower on this variety uh, of channels. Uh, well, I spoke about the retail strategy. Um, so wet sampling is very, very critical in this case. That is the only way to expand uh, your consumer base with each individual stores, although it's expensive. But what has been very successful is rather than you know just giving small portions of your product, you know if you could make uh, make dishes out of it, you know like if you're selling milk and you know you made a kheer as an example, or you did um, uh, you know you're doing a mock meat and you made like a um, vegetarian or, or smart protein based uh, uh, you know butter butter chicken equivalent, that would be. Uh, the way to serve these products. And cross-promoting with brands which are obviously not competing with you, but which go to the same uh, TG is a very effective way of, uh, you know, piggyback riding on brands which are a little ahead of the curve uh, and uh, who have a loyal customer base. Um, 
And this gives you an opportunity, you know, when you do wet sampling extensively with the store and with the involvement of the store uh, owner, uh, you can actually build a community around the store. So this is more of a monologue, Divya. I don't know if uh, I should be taking questions. Should I take it at the end of this session? Yeah, we will take it at the end of the panel uh, discussion, K.O., if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah sure, of course. Perfect. So last one, there will be solutions. So my suggestion is I'm a distributor myself. I've been a distributor for the last 30 years now. So, you know, we see young budding entrepreneurs, they try to do it all themselves, right from manufacturing, thinking, ideating about a product, a business idea, creating the products, uh, doing the marketing, the packaging, uh, the transportation, logistics, all of this, and then they want to go and sell directly to, to, to the customer. Don't do this. You, you know, do what is your core competency, right? Uh, make great products at competitive prices. Leave the uh, last mile, uh, not only delivery, but get assistance from, from established reputed distributors to help you actually craft a great GTM, which is not just on paper, good looking and uh, logical, but, uh, you know, very um, localized and uh, something which can be tweaked and um, you know, you can react very quickly and change and turn this around uh, if you have this guy, because you know, typically reputed distributors will have a very good customer base and they will, in the food service space, at least have great relationships with the customer because this business is driven on credit. So if they're risking their money with the customer, they need to know who the customer is. So use them for their uh, contacts, their relationships to give you market access. And uh, the reason why I prefer working with, uh, I, would, I, would, I would rather that you know, you prefer working with distribution companies rather than logistics companies, simple they have skin in the game. You know, they've invested in your product, they bought your product, now they've got to sell your product. So that's a simple logic and simple reason they are more involved. So, uh, and good reputed companies, you can be sure that they have the resources uh, to maintain the integrity of the supply chain, in, which is really critical in frozen products. Um, so yeah, that is what we should be doing. And uh, so this brings me to the end of uh, this session today. In conclusion, what I would like to say is that, you know, uh, the mantra is to go deep, understand your customer, understand your uh, retailer, understand your food service outlet, what they need, and they are the best guys to actually tell you what your consumer talk is, consumer feedback is, and uh, it will not only help you evolve your product and make a very scalable business um, and uh, uh, you can bring efficiency if you can bring consumption through food service versus spending uh, a lot of money for acquiring customers. So with that, I conclude today's session. Thank you guys uh, for patiently listening to me <laughs> and I'm happy to take the Q&As. Thank you so much. Um, Kayur, that was incredible. Such a fantastic session for me as well. Uh, really well-rounded and comprehensive. Um, I think you've spoken from practical experience and based on day-to-day -day business. It, it really felt like first-hand information um, and some great insider tips towards the end. Um, I think the students are going to find it uh, very valuable as they put together you know, effective and more importantly, feasible solutions, long-term sustainable feasible solutions for the food service channel. So thank you so much for your time um, and effort into this masterclass. Um, we will now get in, uh, what I was thinking is if it's all right with the panelists and Kayur, uh, we would love to get into the panel. 
um, and have our other uh, brand experts speak, and then we can take Q and A towards the end. Yeah, if sure. That works. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Um, so let's jump into that. Um, I would love for uh, our panel experts who are here to do a quick round of uh, introductions um, of themselves, your brand, um, and then we can have, it'll be back to you, Kyo, to moderate the panel. Um, Dabindu, would you like to get us started? Uh, sure. Hi, this is uh, Dabindu. I run a brand called Mighty Foods. We are into ready to heat and eat, ready to cook and serve plant-based food, you know, where we're doing ready recipes, ready food. And uh, we're doing a lot of interesting products. So we're doing, you know, your galottis, your keema bows, and we are, uh, you know, doing an end product. So our whole competence is on giving people an end product, which they can make it in six, seven minutes, cook and eat, you know, that is what we are doing. Thank you, Divendu. So, uh, Roman, would you like to go next? Sorry. Um, hey, Kayo, good to see you. Divya, even though we haven't met, but good stuff. Um, so for everyone here, I'm Romil. Uh, we run a small, relatively new brand called uh, Plant Away. Um, we've reached some base level of... Uh, I'd say distribution, thanks to Keor and his team. Um, he's absolutely right in everything he said. Go to a distributor. Don't go to a logistics company, um, especially when your approach is Orica first, uh, which is exactly what our approach was. Um, we're not limited to just the plant-based meat category. We actually offer the entire range. We do plant-based dairy beverage alternatives with an oat milk and almond milk. Um, we do dairy staples, butter and cheese. Uh, we also do meat alternates. We also do a set of uh, mayos and dressings, which are all plant-based. And I think that is something that stemmed from our Horeca approach because we're not going out there to sell a product. We have gone to Horeca to sell a solution. So Roman, it is very interesting. You've been on both sides of the table, right? I still am. <laughs> so Romil, uh, let me introduce uh, Romil a little better. So he has been an entrepreneur for a very long time, done uh, various concepts in the f &D, the culinary um, space. Uh, and he's also uh, headed uh, the business for a five-star hotel and uh, he's a brand owner. They, the group owns some of the best known brands in the country. I will let Roman do the introduction on all of that. So it would be very interesting to understand, Roman, you know, what has been your takeaway? You know, how have you won chefs and restaurants? Because we've seen that Plant Away has done an exceedingly good job in a very, very short period of time. Um, I think uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of the learning that we have is uh, when it comes to Horeca and chefs is because like you pointed out, I come from that side of the business. Uh, for everyone who's listening in, I've spent 30 years running hotels and restaurants. Um, chefs are uh, complicated people. But chefs also appreciate simplicity and that's what we've tried to provide. Um, chefs know exactly what they want. They're not, they're not people who sit on the fence. They know what kind of end product and what kind of quality that they'd like to offer their customers. And they also know the capabilities of their teams. And the moment you make something that's complicated for their team to understand, um, it doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, functionality um, and application are the most important things in any product that you are selling. Um, so if you have an oat milk that can make a coffee, but you can't make a kheer, then you have a problem. Um, or if you have if you have a kheema, alternate that doesn't know like real kima, that means the cook on the line has to spend extra time on it. They don't understand that because on the line, it's not the executive chef who's cooking. It's a frontline commie or a cook. Um, and he understands a recipe and he understands a process. If he doesn't get the quality that he's expecting and he doesn't get the, and he doesn't get the functionality that he's expecting out of this product as compared to the real product, it's, it's as simple as this, that your product is in the hands of someone else. Think about this and, and just 
I mean, the easiest parallel that you could draw would be um, to a home. Um, if you're lucky, you'll have someone at home who helps you cook. Uh, getting more and more difficult in these days, but I'm pretty old. And while I was growing up, we had a cook and we still do. Now I can go out and get mutton kheema from the mutton wala I normally buy from at more than 500 bucks a kilo. Uh, and I can give it to Shabana and say, make me biryani. She knows I have to wash it. I have to put so much oil, I have to put so much onion, so much masala, cook the kheema for so much time on this much flame. And while that is happening, I can do other stuff. If I give her plant-based kheema and it does not behave exactly the same and the biryani does not turn out nice, she is going to come and say, Bhaiya, ye kya leke hai? Ya, please mat leke hai. which means it's never gone into my mouth, but the product has been written off. And this is unlike any other consumer category. Think about it. I'm sure, especially since we're talking to students and there are a lot of young people here, we all know fast fashion. We all buy stuff from Zara. We know when we buy something from Zara, It'll cost you 2,000 rupees. You know you'll wash it five times and you'll throw it away. You don't want to throw it away, but you will because it doesn't last. But you will still go back and buy Zara. That's not the case with food. You put something in your mouth. You say, this is not good. I'm never buying it again. Or Shabana will cook and say, Bhaiya, ye achha nahi hai. you'll never buy it again. So I think functionality and application is something that we focused on. And I'm sure a lot of brands are doing that now. Uh, we had a fantastic session when it came to something that the GFI put together a little while ago, where we were talking about uh, marketing and about growing the category jointly, uh, because sometimes there's strength in numbers. And rather than compete, we will all always compete. Uh, but at the same time, when you have a common voice and you're all speaking the same language, uh, then you compete on quality, not on price, which is very important. Great for distributors as well. We don't have to undercut each other. don't have to give discounts. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I guess a lot of this learning here and for everyone else comes from the fact that I've spent, I've spent 30 years running hotels and restaurants and we're looking for quality, we're looking for simplification. And that's the learning that we've put into building the brand. Uh, not been easy. Um, super, super difficult six months into it. Uh, running a 500 room hotel, which get, got 10,000 guests a day across places was far easier. This is like... <laughs> This is like really, really tough. So kudos to everyone out here who's doing a great job. And some of the brands that Kevin mentioned are really doing a kick-ass job. And I, I, I mean, we've had a few really interesting conversations through GFI at various forums. It's a fascinating space to be. Um, it's growing. It's slow. It's going to take effort and patience. And I, and I think with all of us doing stuff in the space and being supported, uh, not just from a distribution standpoint, but I think what distributors, more, rather than distributors, I'd say organizations like TJ UK and Keur are partners in every sense. They're also taking as much as risk as we are because they're buying our product. Uh, I, I know that we push his team every day to say, you're going on a sales call, mm -hmm. take me with you. Take uh, me here, take me there. Uh, if I we went to president with one of your guys yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have done a great job, Romil. So, you know, on a similar note, so Dibendu here is also been a um, uh, restaurant here for the longest time. And uh, he and his entire family are in that business for generations now. And I've tried his product and I can swear by his galotti kebab. I just can't stop having enough of it. Uh, and he's done a very interesting uh, route he set into market, which is of the cloud kitchens uh, space. So it would be very interesting, Devendu, if you could share your insights on, um, on, on, on that side of the business and using you know, all these food tech plat platforms like Swiggy, et cetera, et cetera. And what is it that you do exactly with that? And so, what is you know, your take sorry. on it? So you know, it's very interesting uh, you know, because plant-based food is one category where uh, it's still getting there. You know, It's not there. But, uh, you know, we firmly believe that India or anywhere in the world, it's taste first, you know, for people, unless and until the food is tasty, people don't really care whether it's healthy or not. You Absolutely. Know, so that, is, that is a very, very critical point, which is, uh, you know, which people need to take care, take uh, into notice and they need to do that. And that is the reason why, you know, we said, uh, uh, let us try and get our product to as many people as we can and uh, experiment with it, you know, so that is where that whole idea of 
doing a cloud kitchen where people can order food which is ready because you know the biggest challenge you would agree uh, like romal pointed out is that uh, for people to cook a product is still a challenge you know to cook the right way to cook the right meat to make it in the correct manner is still a challenge so you know we said uh, rather than people struggling with how the end product is or how the end taste is let us give them an end taste so that you know they we know that this is how a plant prawn curry should be eaten or this is how a keema bao should be eaten or this is how a plant based butter chicken should be eaten so that that acceptability grows higher and uh, you know running uh, probably a cloud kitchen is again uh, cost more cost effective than setting up a restaurant or setting up you know a full fledged uh, food service outlet you know so it gives us that opportunity to get our food across to people at probably a lesser cost or maybe you know a fraction of the cost of setting up a restaurant it gives us insights on what the customer is because you know in terms of uh, today social media today food service platform people are vocal about how they feel about your food you know whether good bad ugly they would write to you they would tell you that this is good this is not good the repeat orders so you know that whole customer insight comes in and that is something that uh, that is something you know which is uh, yeah so you know which is which is helping us to develop products we can experiment we can take out uh, dishes which are say okay you know let me try out this let me and for us to you know rather than going and launching everything as a diy kit in the market it is better for us to try like if you want to try a sikh kebab roll or a galotti kebab roll or you know anything which is a variation of a product it is far easier for us to do in a cloud kitchen platform rather than you know launch a product and you know how the whole packaging everything you know uh, going the whole nine yards we can control it and we can take a call on what works and what does not work for us so i think that is something that uh, is there i mean it has challenges also like you know cloud kitchen running a cloud kitchen has challenges uh, you know you have to struggle with the higher margins that a swiggy zomato charge you have to struggle with your brand visibility uh, again you know one of the biggest challenges that we've had in setting up a cloud kitchen on a swiggy platform is uh, to get the point across that a keema is a vegetarian you know because of their algorithm a keema gets tagged as a non veg so forever we are literally you know saying boss keema this is a plant based keema this is a vegetarian or this is a plant prawn this is a vegetarian so you know it is very difficult we've been doing that you know every day we have that non veg tag coming in and we have to literally say boss sir yeah, this is vegetarian it's a pure vegetarian outlet you know all those small small things are very very interesting to deal with where you understand that you know again uh, in the broader scheme of things you are still getting there and uh, i think um, now what is needed for a plant based brand or any brand that wants to enter this space is that we have to get out and make people try the product and you know like you, we've always had this discussion that unless and until you get the product out whether it is through a restaurant whether it is through a cloud kitchen whether it is through a food service because a d2c or an end consumer will only buy once they have tasted the product you know very few people would end up buying a product and you know making it and tasting it so i think that is a gap that we all together need to fill so uh, if i may you know it's a very interesting thing you know we've saw or sold beyond meat um, or distributed beyond meat in india and uh, it been such a strong international brand and both impossible food and beyond meat they came to fame was through the food service businesses uh, internationally and they become like uh, you know uh, valued at gazillion dollars because of what they did but in india they went the retail route and right. trust me um, in spite of that being such a strong brand uh the numbers are not coming so i think uh, that's because we're not really happy. happy with and though we've done a great job of distribution right i mean it's it's available in uh more number of outlets than i thought that we would get uh, penetration into and we did get the penetration but didn't really happen and that product is really good right i'm sure it's also there it's also because it's really expensive for even even by indian standards even though none of our products are cheap in the traditional sense yeah uh, but when you have a 999 rupee price you sort of limiting your market to a really tiny number of people and i think genuinely yeah. there isn't a frame of reference for taste uh, yeah. exactly what devendu pointed out a little while ago taste is very critical 
we are not a country that eats beef burgers other than this much of people but they sell is a beef product so right. it's all about the frame of reference right in india when you think about a non vegetarian even a non vegetarian right. will order a order a say a tangri kebab a chicken tangri kebab and you find a little bit of red or a little bit of cartilage right near the bone and they will send it back and say ye kachcha hai isko barabar se pakao in the us where they are making you a a burger patty which is beef and they are putting beetroot juice in it to simulate blood because that's the way they cook they want a rare burger in india even if your plant based beef is bleeding you would have a problem so there are there are cultural issues uh, yeah you know, one size doesn't fit all right you will just chipping in there uh, one of the thing yeah hi ke uh, sorry jumping in hi hi how are you pradeep good good thank you thank you for having me uh, <laughs> so actually as you know uh, evolve food started out as a restaurant first we started the first uh, restaurant that served uh, seitan hi dibendu sorry <laughs> hi yeah so it started out as a restaurant first because when we had come back from uh, singapore roma and myself uh, we had tried a lot of plant based meat there but we did not see any plant based meat available in india this was back in 2017 2018 and uh, we ran this restaurant just to speak to consumers and try to understand what they want uh from a plant based protein or plant based meat so uh, one of the thing that jumped at us uh, predominantly is people do not cook uh, burger at home uh so beyond meat making themselves available for rtc uh, sorry for the uh, direct to consumers uh, there are very few people who stock a burger bun or lettuce and other things at home so they can make a burger and enjoy it it's a fun food still when you go out with your family you tend to enjoy it more uh, so its association itself is with the uh, fun and picnic and all that not nutrition so i think I, it's the format you know pradeep yeah. globally people grill burgers in india every rtc product in the market is breaded and you deep fry it or you shallow fry it you don't grill anything yeah yeah True. so uh, it loses its appeal as a you know smart protein when you have to deep fry it and consume all the time so it needs to be healthy uh, across consumptions so so pradeep uh, it will be interesting to understand about evolved foods and what do you do exactly and uh, you know uh, how did you start because you've taken a very different route to your products and the way they are presented you have a very different base recipe i understand not that i'm wanting you to share any secrets here <laughs> but uh, for you to take that bend uh, which is different than the run of the mill uh, mock meats which are available world over uh, if you could share something on that sure yeah. uh, so actually it goes back to house of satan when our original plan was from house of satan you release a certain set of products that is for the market but consumer market was always something in our purview <clears throat> so when we were talking to consumers something that jumped at us was unless we are able to get into their biryanis and curries as romil mentioned earlier uh, it will be a very rare consumption so a nugget uh, deep frying that may happen once in 15 days will not happen every day so if we need volumes we need to increase the frequency uh, and that also uh, connects with our culinary heritage itself agar biryani banani hai sare masale dalo like three or four cti chadao so we cook and sometimes we also abuse the uh, ingredients to an extent because that is our culinary culture so uh, that is why we thought the uh, burger patties or anything that we might be able to develop or the gluten based products we could import from international market and sell wouldn't work for india because in india it needs to go into your uh, deep fryer it needs to go into microwave tandoori all kinds of applications so uh, we identified that as the primary requirement and then uh, took about two and a half years around one and a half i 150 iterations we had done to develop wow. to develop the product that we have right now and the process through which we are able to develop this product which uh, gives you the gives you the experience of whole muscle mutton and depending on how you cook it it can also emulate chicken mm. uh, 
Kendu has tried our food as well. I think you have tried it in a few. Yes, I do. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a superb, super product. Yeah. Thank There's you. A lot of experiment, a lot of curries with that. Yes, absolutely. So, I, uh, stop, I went back for three three helpings uh, <laughs> in Delhi. When you were just playing, I remember that. Thank you. Thank you. So it is made simple uh, with soy, rice protein and coconut for fat. Okay. Uh, you said it may be secret recipe. Actually, secrecy is in the process, which is a patent that we hold. Uh, so this process sort of enables us to develop that random muscle bonding, uh, which is seen in the typical muscle tissues. So we are able to develop that and offer that. And uh, the product goes through about 25 minutes of cooking time without uh, becoming uh, blistered. And uh, it it is one of the leanest proteins in the market because we are able to, we are using coconut. So it is 15% protein, less than 5% fat. Uh, so. Phenomenal. Though, uh, uh, you know, I don't think uh, at this point of time, uh, you have the evolved consumers. Uh, it's a very small subset of the consumers who are actually looking at uh, the nutritional content and all of this. Uh, I think the biggest market is uh, non-vegetarians or flexitarians, as you call them, moving on to the bandwagon of saying, hey, you know, I want to go vegetarian, I want to go plant-based. I think uh, uh, through my understanding from the business, that is the largest section of the consumers in this space. And I think you've made it with the taste. So congratulations on that. And uh, uh, I would like to call uh, Gaurav, my friend, from Greenest. I think his business has been very clearly uh, focused on the food service uh, part of it. Very, uh, you know, he's all in on that side as I've seen it so far and from what I know. So Gaurav, if you could do an introduction and share your insights. Thank you, okay. You're very, very inspiring and insightful session. Well, we burnt our fingers with D2C and then we actually, you know, hopped onto the bandwagon of B2B on somebody, somebody as, as seasoned as you, you know, when they mentioned it to us. So our story is, you know, somewhat similar to what Pradeep's is. Pradeep, by the way, I think House of Seasons should come back. It was pretty legendary, huh, by the way. Um, <laughs> we, we, guys, we guys launched with a um, vegetarian, vegan friendly, um, you know, plant based restaurant. And we ran into a problem when our customers used to keep coming back to us and saying, boss, chicken kyun nahi aake pizza pe? So that we were actually selling mock meat back in 2015 when a lot of people did not even know, you know, you know how to relate the word mock to the word meat. And uh, out of, you know, out of that experience, we had a quick insight is that we are satiating somebody's palate without drilling a hole in their pocket and they're good to go, even if they are meat eaters. So that's when we thought that, you know, um, we, we should probably get into an FMCG mode to extrapolate this and scale this thing. So uh, that's how Greenest, you know, came into being. We exported the first consignment of plant-based meat to the US and we have now also opened Australia, New Zealand and Canada. So exports is something that's really helping us. But yeah, uh, even in the export, uh, you know, uh, geographical uh, format, it's actually food service, which is really, uh, you know, leading the whole of this thing. And I'll tell you one thing from my experience is that, you know, earlier I used to harbor this ambition of being a national brand. And I was talking to a gentleman and a very seasoned FMCG guy a few months back. And I was telling him, I said, listen, I want to, you know, get into these many cities by this time. He said, tell me one thing. What is more important for you? Do you think sales is more important or being a national brand is more important? So I said, listen, if I honestly think about it, I'm, I'm too small to be a national brand. So he said, the fact is that you can be a massive brand even if you have a strong regional presence. And he said, this couldn't be more true in the case of food. Because, we, you know, consumer behavior and their palate preference is changing every few kilometers. So he said, if you expect your Amritsari Kima to sell well in Pune, he said, chances are that it's not going to do so well. So sell your Amritsari Kima probably in the northern part of the country. You know, that's where consumers will pick it up and you'll get repeat purchases very soon. And that's what we started realizing, started happening with us. So, you know, these are um, my, my big learning from my journey till now is that if one wants to be big, they first have to be small. And by that, I mean that, and Kayur, I can't really, you know, um, uh, I, I feel that what you said 
uh, this will stick around with me for a very long time is that going deep rather than going wide. Because startups in most cases, and I'll tell you, you know, like Roman and Dimbindu, these guys are like heavyweights in the food industry. I come from a non-food background. I, I was, a, I'm a chartered accountant. I opened a restaurant. I burned my fingers multiple times just getting a, you know, getting a hang of how food works in the first place. Then FMCG. That's actually even more challenging. So um, this is what I realized is that uh, having a strong regional presence. There are so many spice brands also in India. Just if I have a name, I don't know many people will not know. And we'll actually look at their balance sheets. They would be bigger than thousand crores. The largest detergent brand in our country is Ghadi Detergent. They became the number one pair in detergents after 25 years of incorporating. Why? For the first 20 years, they did not even step out of Kanpur, which was their home ground. So what my big takeaway from this journey till now has been that, you know, um, try being big in your limited geography. And once you optimize your value chain there, you know, and your playbook is in place, that's the time when you step out and capture the world. Well said, well said, Gaurav. I completely buy that point. I have to add something to that. Sure. While, 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 you, while you so generously called Jubiendu and myself heavyweights in the hospitality industry, so while you, you were burning your fingers, <laughs> we are burning our fingers every day and wondering why we are doing this. It was so much easier burning our fingers in restaurants and hotels. Yes, he I, went, I agree with that. <laughs> he went away. Completely Hello. agree. You know, it's a it's, uh, different... Uh, burn all together and you know the oh, burn yeah. you don't feel the burn you know when you're running a restaurant you can see it on the eyes of the customer here you don't know what you what you're doing and what you're selling to you know you're right that's yeah. another thing when you're when you're doing hospitality if someone doesn't like something they tell you you can fix it if someone likes something and they praise you you can go back and tell your team right. great stuff guys here uh yeah way more complicated man way more complicated yeah, yeah, consumers are unpopular. <laughs> Hell yes. Sorry, okay, what you were so saying. Are, uh, uh, why don't you come in with your thoughts? I we discussed something in the morning. So uh, sorry, Keo, did you say something to me? No, no, I said, why don't you come in? Sure, yes. Um, no, what a fantastic discussion that was. I, I really wish we had more time because coming from a food service background myself, this was so interesting to hear. Um, it's difficult. It's challenging. It's uh, I, I fully agree with the burn, the Vendu, Gaurav, Romil. Uh, I don't quite miss the chef life, but uh, it, it really warms my heart that smart protein products um, are, are very slowly but steadily traversing these expectations uh, that has been set by conventional animal products. And, you know, not only in the minds of consumers, but in the minds of culinarians, restauranters, hospitality professionals, which, uh, as we spoke in the morning, Keur, it, it holds a big key in unlocking this market. Uh, we've said this a lot where we, we really feel that food service is an avenue that um, consumers are able to get the first try. They're not quite looking out for something, so they don't necessarily have, uh, you know, a set uh, expectation in mind. Food service also has the ability to position a dish um, and a specific ingredient, the smart protein based raw product in a different way as opposed to what you see in a retail shelf. Um, so they have the opportunity to play around and create um, a different positioning in the minds of the consumers, uh, which can then, you know, then it'll work around when they go and purchase products in the retail shelf that they can reproduce based on what they've consumed uh, in a restaurant or a hotel or a cafe. So um, thank you so much, um, KU, for moderating this so wonderfully. And uh, thank you, panelists, for lending your time, experience, and learnings today. Yeah, KU, go ahead. Before we finish the session, I would like to throw a question to all the panelists here. Uh, all of them are very experienced and they've been around in this space for a while. Uh, so what do you think about the pricing? You know, price being a barrier to expanding the market. Uh, like I shared with you, uh, the ProChart experience, and we were delighted to see that acceptance. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, it would be very interesting to understand, and I'm sure um, for the students as well. 
you know, if I just may, unfortunately, I have a flight to catch. So I'm going to answer this and then I'm going to have to run. But um, price parity is something that everyone's talking about. Um, the interesting thing about price parity is price parity also comes with volume and consumption. There are markets where chicken costs way more than others because there's only this much consumption. The whole world about three months ago was talking about the fact that just egg has finally reached price parity with real eggs in the US. But it wasn't just eggs that became cheaper. It was that eggs went up by 30% because they were in short supply. Mm -hmm. But everyone's very happy about the fact that eggs and just egg now are the same price. Um, so I, I think it's something that's going to take time. Uh, anything in any, any product that is small and made in small quantities. We don't have the ability. I mean, personally, I don't think as plant away, we don't have the ability to go out and order two tons. I'd be able to get a 30% cost reduction if I could order five tons at one shot. Uh, but I can't. Uh, because it's not just the product, right? It's also packaging. It's a, it's a lot of stuff where the prices would come down today. I have no choice but to make smaller batches because we don't see the offtakes as yet. Uh, I think as, as more and more people realize the, the benefits of a plant-based diet, and it's coming. It's slow. Uh, but more and more people are realizing it because... All of us collectively sitting here are spending a lot of time, effort on delivering a better quality product. Also spending a lot of money educating people. Um, all of us may or may not reap the benefits. Hopefully the planet will reap the benefit. But I think, I think going forward, there will be this equalization of price. And much like in any other product, your input will determine the price of your output. Uh, and within that also there are qualities, right? So today you know that you can buy a burger somewhere at X price. I mean, I'm, I'm talking real meat or, or milk or any product. You can buy X brand of butter because of the amount of volume that he makes, he can sell it to you at this price. Somebody else says, I'm premium. If you break it down, his probably input is probably the same other than maybe his, I don't know, maybe his cows from France. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Versus a cow from Gujarat. So it it's all a function of volume, it's a function of the amount of money you're putting into branding and marketing. It's where you want to position yourself because in a lot of markets there is differential pricing. You take the UAE as a great example. The concept of MRP does not exist. You can walk into a 7-Eleven and buy a, a tub of a cup of ice cream for like five dirhams and you walk into Carrefour and it's seven and you walk into a Waitrose or a Spinney's and the same cup is ten because of the type of consumer that's coming there. So I think price is Sure, it's a limiting factor for mass adoption today. I think going forward, that too will equalize. That's my sense. Um, I'm not big enough as yet to be very honest to be able to give you uh, too much depth. I've not exported anything <laughs> as yet, so I'm not sure. Uh, but but that's my that's my general sense of of. I mean, price dynamics at large. Uh, yeah. Uh, Romil, I can just add to that a little bit. Uh, I think when it comes to overall product creation itself, there are some import dependencies for some of the people. Uh, okay, you're, that's like even if you source the local products, they do not match up match up to the quality that you can get outside, and they are subjected to heavy taxes. Uh, and also, the product that we are category that we are in, we are attracting eighteen percent GST which is again something which is not creating a level uh, playing field. Thin line, Pradeep. Um, so, you know, what happened to the gelato business in this country is that uh, when they launched gelato, um, you know, they were, they were great brands, uh, which did a good quality product earlier, but the price really went high. And because of which the market could not expand. And so then came this whole host of uh, so-called gelato companies. I'll call them so-called because they really... Um, uh, brought down the quality of the product uh, to meet with price expectations of the consumer. So the market grew for a little time, but eventually the category died. Mm. Right? Gelato is now, uh, I mean, it's really not done as well as it does globally. It's not as respected because of the bad experience of bad quality products. So it's, so balancing between the two is very, very critical. Right? And yeah. uh, uh, and soya chaff is an example on the other end of the spectrum, right? Uh, and uh, well, it's been there, it's growing, it's growing every year, 
And today, soya chaat is like a vegetable, like I said earlier. So uh, it's a dichotomy of sorts, you know, for, uh, uh, for I can imagine for people like you, brand owners, entrepreneurs, uh, and it's very interesting. I don't have any answer for that. In fact, I am, uh, want to pick your mind. So what are your thoughts? On you this? know, I also think that, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that, you know, price again, is dependent on what you're comparing it to. You know, mm. because if you see the end product, if like, you know, because I have been running restaurants and when I look at an end dish, which is a plant, which is out of probably a plant-based meat versus a normal mutton or a normal chicken, if you're mm. able to give the consumer the same dish at that price point, I don't think the customer is complaining. You know, nobody's coming and saying that, why is your plant-based butter chicken more expensive or plant-based butter chicken the same price as your butter chicken because today you know uh, uh, whether it's a normal meat or whether it's a meat subsidy that you're working with customer is interested in the end product pricing and you know that is where uh, people are buying up 800 rupees 900 rupees plant-based keema or a plant-based ready product also which they are able to serve at the same price point as the normal meat product and that, I think, is more important in terms of us educating the customer, saying that most your end dish is going to cost the same. So, you know, where we get into the rut of saying that, yeah, why is your plant-based at the 600 rupees today, a mutton or a, you know, boneless uh, meat substitute or a boneless meat is at that same price point. So, you know, as long as we are able to give that end dish at the same price point, I don't think a customer has an issue. You know? So, that is where that needs to be educated to people. Because the economies of scale will bring down the cost, but that will take time for everybody to do it. So, Gaurav? We've actually received, uh, uh, achieved parity uh, in a few of the products in the frozen food segment. So, and you know, this takes me back to the fact that I want to optimize my value chain in a small geography. We've done that for Delhi and Punjab, and we have enough loads here that our distribution costs are taken care of and we are launching across formats. So we are launching with, a, let's say, a Aldiram's counterpart in Punjab, which is you know one of the largest there. And we are introducing a, a menu with them, which is on par. Like, you know, there's absolutely no difference. So we've been able to achieve that and we want to actually, um, you know, uh, repeat that sort of success when we enter different geographies. So I feel that uh, with, with this sort of an approach and with a little bit of creativity, I think on the product side, um, product has to be tasty. It doesn't always have to taste like chicken, but it has to taste. It has to be tasty. That's the non-negotiable thing. So that's what we are trying to achieve. Uh, we are trying to create a mix of you know both kinds of products. You know, so how much would you contribute your uh, success, or how much would you bet on that one factor for? Uh, your scaling of your business, uh, which is bringing price parity or a price advantage. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So th I think that's an absolute game changer. If I walk into a restaurant as a consumer, and if I see a new concept, which is spec, let's say at 40% the premium of my, you know, alternate, my, my mainstream product, it deters me. It obviously, it of course, deters me. And, uh, you know, I am even talking about Seke, Seke plus sort of audience. Like they will try it for the first time. You know, you guys are talking about beyond me. I have one of my friends who owns 18 co-working spaces in Delhi NCR. And he was, he had gone to one of the Lee marshes with his wife. And he was, and this guy's been curious, you know, for donkey's years, he wanted to try mock meat. So when beyond came to India, this guy gave me a call and he said, I, you know, bought it and put it in my basket. But at the time of checkout, he said, when I looked at my, looked at the, you know, total of my bill on the screen, he said, I was, I was completely taken aback. And half of my bill was actually, you know, uh, was the Beyond Meat products. So he said, I dropped them off. He said, I can, I can probably try it at a friend's party out of curiosity the first time, but I'm definitely not going to buy it. I'm not going to spend my money on it. So I think that repeat purchase, which leads into a sustained consumer behavior, is very, very closely linked uh, to the pricing of the product. So that, that's a problem that has to be solved head on. Which is what we want. I mean, we from all directions we wanted to solve that problem. So from a product, product, uh, 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 you know, R and D point of view or a distribution strategy point of view, channel strategy, whatever we do in Greenest, 
um, you know, this is the absolute one thing which we have on top of our minds is to get uh, as as uh, pocket friendly as possible. And that's why Soya Chop also succeeded. Soya Chop never really positioned itself as mock meat. But when you actually go and stand outside a Vajiva store, you will see that sales will spike on Tuesdays, they will spike in Savan, they will spike in Navratri. A lot, you, you can see a lot of ladies who used to be meat eaters before uh, marriage, and now they've been married into a vegetarian household. These are the people who are going and eating soya chaat so many times. So I feel that public decides its own perception of a product. So thank you for, uh, for uh, as you can see, you know, we have both sides of the spectrum on this argument. Uh, uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and uh, uh, see what's going to unfold and which is going to be the one deciding factor. But I do agree that, you know, taste for India is uncompromising. You know, we Indians are spoiled for taste. I mean, the, uh, the variety of our cuisine uh, and the spices, the way, the complex way of cooking which we have, and uh, I mean, the time we take, the fresh food that we eat. So pleasing the Indian consumer in terms of taste is a real task for you guys, I can imagine. You know, that's a really big challenge. And uh, what would be the cherry on the cake would be to achieve price parity or price advantage. That would be the ultimate winner is my guess on this. With that, uh, I would like to sign off, Divya, if there is something else. Um, and thank you, Devendu, Pradeep, um, and Gaurav, for this wonderful session today. Huh? Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having before us. Before you guys uh, head out, please, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. If you have a little more time, um, we can just take that quickly. I'm happy sure. to read it out. For you guys, uh, we've got Karan who's asked us about pricing. So we spoke a fair bit about pricing. Karan, I hope that answered your question. Um, we've got a second question from him on how to find the right food service outlet uh, customers or partners. So I would like to take that one. So, um, you know, I gave the example of Starbucks. Now just imagine if Domino's, which is India's largest QSR chain, uh, in number of stores probably, or a number of portions sold, uh, if they were to decide tomorrow to put their mind, their heft behind, you know, a plant-based uh, product, not just have it as one of their offerings, but saying, hey, this is what we do, and, you know, they, they use their marketing dollars to popularize that, that would be a game changer. Uh, or, a, or a local chain, like, you know, uh, Jumbo King, which is more like, a Maharashtra or uh, to go um, even deeper, I would say like, a, uh, you know, so if they can add their brand value uh, and they can back these products, that would be a great uh, food service outlet to select. Thank you, Kaur. Um... We've got one question from Aditya, and this is a is a very is a favorite question for me. How does someone with no Horeka connects approach high end chefs slash restauranters? Uh, do we just pop into the reception and ask for the chef, or is there a better, more systematic way to do it? That's actually a good way to do it. Huh? By the way, we guys also do it every 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 other day. We walk into restaurants and do cold calls. But I think a more structured way to do it is to find a good distributor. Because distributors are the ones who know the pulse of the market and they can marry your product to the market and they can help you in terms of getting your foot in the door because you can tag along with their teams. And, uh, you know, I mean, a distributor like Kayur, he's so, he, ha he has so much skill in the game and obviously because of the personal connect also as far as plant-based is concerned, that when you sit with him, he'll actually make five phone calls right in front of you. So I feel, you know, finding the right distribution partners is, a, is one of the key solutions to this. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, okay, so we've got one on uh, from Vidu on any company which collaborates with premium restaurants and limits the product exclusively to premium ones with the same taste as the iconic dishes. Um, sorry, did someone so say something? I would, 
I would just uh, take that one. There are two angles to this. We do work with quite a few premium restaurants, uh, Shangri-La, uh, Go Pizza, quite a few uh, supply chain partners. Primary reason being that we have not reached the price parity yet. And they have a put ability to command that price premium that can keep the boat floating. Uh, yeah, I mean, having said that, uh, unless you have something which is uh, unique, something as a secondary or tertiary message that can work, uh, if you are saying it is better than soy chop or it is better than chicken or it is a plant-based version of the same, then there is a neck-to-neck -neck comparison which becomes very difficult to break through. So uh, it needs to be sort of kept in mind when you are approaching your restaurant partners. So your approach will differ based on what you have. There's no straight answer for one, you know, for the entire category. Thanks, Pradeep. I think she was also trying to understand if that uh, working exclusively with premium restaurants um, and promoting like a premium dish, uh, if it worked out like the app, Apple effect or um, if, you know, not really. <laughs> So we don't have such big, uh, wider brands as Kyur mentioned. There are very few who have significant presence, but India is also like very wide and spread out. Even in the bigger cities, there are areas where these big brands cannot reach. So exclusivity is something which is very difficult in the in the Horeka market per se, uh, because it won't get you the reach. You need to have a again secondary business plan that get, gets involved. So I think uh, to underline that point uh, of Apple effect, so Beyond Meat, uh, as expensive as it is, but there are enough restaurants in, in the big cities of India which can afford to pay the price, but uh, there has not been much acceptance of that product. So I think there is a story there uh, which needs to be um, taken into consideration here. Yeah. Thank you, Kayur. Um, we'll take one last question in the interest of time. Um, when we are producing plant-based meat or dairy products, sometimes we have to compromise the nutritional quality for taste and texture. How can we strike the right balance between these two? This is the original question. Uh, a favorite uh, one from GFI has always been, do we need to strike a balance between these two at this point for the mass market? I'd love to hear from uh, the brands on this. So I think, you know, it's it's all about uh, the taste. As long as uh, you can give the end dish the proper taste, people are not really into that texture or not really into how close is to the meat. Like if I'm having a dish which is supposed to be had, like if I'm doing a prawn thai curry. Now, if I'm a prawn thai curry, by the end of the uh, dish, I feel it's good and I feel the taste is good. My job is done. You know, I don't need to get it as close to a prawn or as close as to a texture of a meat. But the end dish has to be tasty. You know, it has to want me to go back and order more. That is where the key is. You know, it is not about texture. Today, you know, we live in a country where the same meat is cooked in 25 different textures, you know. So when you are having a mutton in a uh, kolapuri, it's a different taste. When you're having it in a biryani, it's a different texture. So, you know, we as Indians or all over the world, the meat has got different textures. But as long as the complete dish stands out, I think that is what people should go for rather than going for texture or going in for the mouthfeel or the uh, you know, nutritional. Yes, is important. But uh, in my opinion, the taste comes first, then convenience comes in, then your nutrition comes in, you know, and then the pricing comes in. You know, So this is if I have to put it in that order, that would be my order of putting it. Yeah, taste, taste trumps all in India. Taste trumps all. Yeah. True, that's true. Sorry. Uh, that's it then. We don't have any more questions. Um, but I think participants, if you have more questions, you can sh share that with Devika or Harini and we can take that up later. Um, Apart from that, we are all done. Thank you, Pradeep, Gaurav, uh, Dibindu, Romil, of course, had to leave. Um, and thank you so much, Kayur. Uh, the panel was wonderful. Uh, 
there was a lot that even I've learned out of this session. So ISPIC participants, I hope you caught all that because there's so much to think about. Um, and we've got a recording of the session for you to refer to later. Um, I hope you will spend the time digesting this information and putting together a fantastic paper. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.